I have for most of my life borne a healthy skepticism of reading into what many call synchronicities. Finding coincidences and benign things that support your assumed primacy in this world bring to mind the solipsism of some upper-class latte-drinking soccer mom who thanks God for the short line at Starbucks and knows with absolute certainty that it is the sovereign hand of providence that moved the celestial spheres just right so as to produce the ideal parking space at Target. Crystal-bearing, supplement-taking yoga enthusiasts aside, I do think there is something to synchronicities that cannot be denied. I've often wondered if what many call quote-unquote synchronicity could be explained as the revelation of the teleological nature of the universe in an individual's personal story. Put another way, synchronicity is a mysterious manifestation of how language functions and is a mirror or pattern of how reality itself does. The world around us has far too much information for our brain to take in all at once, and so our conscious mind filters some things out while categorizing other things as worth attention or retaining. The rubric we use to engage in this filtering of reality is similar to the point or theme of a story as I mentioned before. This point or theme organizes the seemingly disjointed aspects of our story into causal relationships and ultimately a cohesive unity. This is a topic I want to cover in great deal later, but for now, to make my point, I will use the example of a red stop sign. If you were to extract an individual from somewhere who has no idea what cars, roads, etc. are, and does not speak the English language, and confronted them with a stop sign, that individual will not see it as a symbol or a sign. When they perceive the red octagonal thing on the tip of a straight line, their brain will attempt to contextualize the sight into a framework they already have. This might lead them to call it a tree, or a strange, large fruit, etc. Conversely, we don't think of it as magical when an individual does have the prerequisite context of cars, roads, the English language, etc., and can look upon this object and not just see a dead material thing, but a symbol. They see a sign. It is my belief that this is how synchronicities work. And again, I will cover this in depth with the help of our friend Carl Jung in a later chapter. But suffice it to say that I believe synchronicities seem to simply be a manifestation of the mechanics of how all languages work, the reading of a set of objective things as symbolic. These specific objective things will be understood and organized as symbolic by the measure of some frame or context, and that context is dictated by a goal. The stop sign is interpretable as a symbol thanks to its functionality within the goal we have of making our travel within automobiles safe. This is yet another example of how our narratives dictate our attention and how our attention shapes our reality. Another way of putting this is, the stop sign is not a single piece of base matter. It is a metal pole, set of screws, flattened sheet of metal, a bit of paint, etc. In order for us to put a bracket around a set of objects like this and refer to it as a gestalt or a single noun, we have to hierarchically organize these constituent parts under a purpose. The stop sign is understood teleologically, not materialistically. We see a set of unrelated parts as a harmony of identity because of its purpose. Without this purpose, the stop sign decomposes into its separate idiosyncratic parts. The quote unquote life of the stop sign is present only when its purpose is breathed into it by us. Now that I've hopefully assuaged your fear that I use magic healing crystals or purchase lottery tickets according to angel numbers, I want to present some strange synchronicities within my own life because I think in many ways they illustrate how mapping the archetypal realm can be done, why that's important to me, and hopefully express why that should be important to us. When I was very young, I was inexplicably drawn to trains. While I now can postulate with the clarity of retrospect, I have no idea what inspired the initial attraction. Regardless, I absolutely loved them. I loved playing with toy trains, making tracks for them, and dressing up like a conductor. As I grew, around the age of five or six, 
This love for trains became rivaled by an infatuation with pirates, specifically from the golden age of piracy between the 16 and 1700s. I would dress like one, talk like one, and devour any artifacts of entertainment containing them. I even remember being viscerally pleased with the aesthetics of the pirate garb and paraphernalia. I was far too young to have consciously chosen these two attractions. It's as if some abstract nugget of virtue glistened and caught my eye, and my pursuit of this virtue was manifesting a me the five-year-old only knew on some primordial, essential level, as if both the attraction and the virtue were conspiring to manifest a physical map of some quintessential me. Something else that caught my curiosity is found in names and their often forgotten meanings. I have no idea how the naming of a thing works. Now, I don't mean how names work in our everyday life, but rather why we are drawn to ascribing the characteristics of a specific name to a new individual before they have the chance to manifest what those names mean. Regardless, some strange things happen when I view my life in retrospect through the lens of a goal. I believe this would be the case for everyone who does so. And though I have no idea how or why, another strange facet of life I have seen patterns emerge within is names. I will use my own name, or rather the myths of my namesakes, to illustrate the eerie narrative throughline that presents itself when observed through the bird's eye lens of a goal. To start, my first name Christopher comes from a strange Christian myth. I must warn you, the story behind this first one is a bit of a doozy, and I plan on making a separate video devoted to telling this myth in full. For now, I'll say that St. Christopher was originally named Reprobus, and was a large Canaanite man on the search for the best king to serve. He finds out one day that the powerful king he's been serving is afraid of the devil, so he logically seeks to serve the devil. Yet one day, he catches the devil cowering before the sign of the cross. This causes Reprobus to believe Christ must be the best king, for after all, he instilled fear in the devil himself. He sought to serve this king called Christ, and after being rejected by Christians, for Reprobus had the head of a dog, and the Christians were not in the practice of baptizing monsters, he was told to carry people across a dangerous river by a mysterious monk after admitting that he could not perform things like fasting, etc. One day, a small child asks to be carried across the river. As Reprobus does this, he notices the river begin to swell, and that the small child becomes heavier and heavier, to the point that Reprobus found he could barely carry him. Somehow, through immense difficulty, they make it to the other side. He speaks to the child, saying, You have put me in the greatest danger. I do not think that the whole world could have been as heavy on my shoulders as you were. The child looked into his eyes and replied, You had on your shoulders not only the whole world, but the one who made it. I am Christ your King, whom you are serving by this work. And in that moment, the child vanished. And it is for this reason that from that day forward, Reprobus was named Christopher, which means Christ bearer. Allegedly, St. Christopher is also the patron saint of the end of the world, whatever that means. My middle name Douglas is a Scottish name of Gaelic origin, which means dark river. And finally, my last name, Noise is an English variant of the name Noah. The name Noah means rest or repose, and the well-known biblical myth of Noah includes its main character constructing a vessel to house his family and chosen animals within to survive an apocalyptic flood. At risk of being obvious, I'll point out the noticeable through line of water and specifically of characters attempting to navigate that water to carry some thing of importance to some other side, be it a dark river or a flood. I have spent a great deal of time analyzing why I might have been drawn to the things I was as a child, like trains and pirates. And part of that analysis included distilling these areas of interest down into their archetypal essences. 
For example, in an abstract sense, what is a train? From what I can surmise, a train in its most essential form is a vessel that carries things from one place to another utilizing a pre-existing track. This abstraction could be understood as language. The train is the specific statement, the cargo is the idea, and the track is the existing language and context that the idiosyncratic statement uses. Was I, on some fundamental and naive level, drawn to the idea of communication through the physical and symbolic manifestation of trains? This seems similar to what I covered before with the example of early humanity and its megaliths. We were attempting to interact with and comprehend some archetypal truth through physical means. But what about pirates? First, it's important to note that through the naive rose-colored glasses of my youth, I did not associate pirates with actual piracy, and thus nor the pillaging, plundering, and violence, etc. As with the example of trains, I was drawn to some abstract quality within the vessel of the modern idea of pirates. So again, what are the core components of these fantasy pirates? Well, firstly, they could be understood as somewhat of the punk rockers of exploration, living on the fringes of an established order, the British Empire in this case, on the mostly uncharted oceans of chaos. Pirates are liminal characters, appropriately associated with water. They lived almost entirely on ships, which acted as small proxies of order or land amongst this water or chaos. They utilized these vessels to transport treasure across the water. This could be understood as another localized representation of the archetypal process of communicating. One could also argue that the romantic fantasy abstraction of this pirate as a rebellious explorer symbolizes the frustration with exploring as a means to conquer and reduce all unexplored unknowns to colonized knowns. While this frustration is paradoxical, so is the goal of ultimately mapping the world. If the whole of the world is known, then the job of the explorer is rendered obsolete. 